Fistful of Lead. Might and Melee. Fistful of Lead Fantasy. I ordered this, and Wiley Games sent me this. This is the core rule book. It's a universal system. This starts adding in period-specific flavor. Great art. So the, just to kind of show you, the art in here is, um, you know, it's a little lacking. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, black and white. It's, uh, you know, it's nice, though. You know, we got some, got some fun pictures of, uh, what are we looking at here? War Games Foundry Viking, painted by the author. Games Workshop, painted by the author. Oh, man, these, these Grail Knights. Oh, so much fun. They're Questing Knights, Crusader Knights, whatever they call it. Hey, look, but this is just the basic generic. Look at Might and Magic. Look at the, again, this is probably all painted by Jay Wiley. Yep, published by Wiley Games. Oh, Good-looking stuff. Now, these rules are not really fantasy. These are mainly just your straight Dark Ages, kind of late medieval. Not a whole lot of gunpowder in these. And man, the, the just the, the inspirational figures. Look at that with the, the woven fence and the... Oh, baby, man. You are getting me excited. Dungeons and Dragons grew out of the medieval miniatures, and then they just started adding rubber monsters in. I really need to start collecting more medieval miniatures. So, you know, Jay Wiley, thanks for sending this to me. Full disclosure, when I tell you what I think of this game, I'm going to tell you what I really think. I didn't ask for this. He didn't put any conditions on it. However, what am I, some kind of jerk? Somebody's going to do something nice for me, and I'm going to go, oh, that sucks. I don't think so. So I might be a little bit biased, but hey, you don't need to tell you don't need to take my opinion for it. Let's go look at the game itself. See how it plays. I'm not gonna go into any great detail here in the first start of this this video. I'll put together an introduction video later. Hey, doing things backwards, that's the Wargamer way. The pre-dawn hours of Simpleton. The mists are starting to burn off. And there's danger afoot. The church bells start ringing, and the townsfolk come a-running. Couple of things to point out. I told you this is kind of the medieval, uh, might and melee is just the medieval rules. This is the only book we're using today. The second book in the series adds in spells, and then the third book adds in monsters and mazes for that full adventure. Not owl bears. <laughs> owl bears. We have a history. I'm going to do... Now, not only am I going to start off learning how to play this game with just the basic rules, I'm going to do something a little different. Fistful of Lead uses an interesting balancing mechanic. Everybody gets five figures. You've got a leader, a second in command, and three mooks. In my case, I'm going to use a leader and two mooks. Let's take a look at the cultists first. The black sorcerer, Rorekros, has sent three of his minions. What you're looking at is a leader and two general fighter types here. Fistful of Lead does not use profiles. There's no numbers, it's just a trait-based system. Everybody rolls a d10 for all of their task rolls, fighting, shooting, whatever, and everybody moves at the same speed until you start slapping labels on them. Here in the House of Wargaming, we're all about those labels, all about those cliches. They save a lot of time. So you're looking here at Deacon Nokaid. He is a leader, which means his allies get a bonus if they can see him. They're within 12 inches. He's cold-blooded. He is fearless, impervious. He is a veteran, meaning he rolls d12 on all of his task rolls. And then he is also deadly at the melee strike. He is wearing light armor. He's got a sword. And he's got a totem that gives him one reroll. See the, uh, see the skull? That gives him a reroll. He is backed up by two mooks who are sent to dig up the bodies. They're desecrating hallowed ground. Darn them. You've got a sword grunt over here on the right. He is loyal. He will not flee when he's recovering from shock. Uh, they, and both of these guys have light armor, meaning they get a, they get a save. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, one of them has a big sword. One of them has a big axe. They both do uh, plus one to wound, and they both reduce armor for the guys they hit. And they both have totems. So you're looking at a fairly lightly armed crew relative to the townies. So let's go take a look at those guys. The guy in the center here is Baron Nerob. He is also a leader and also a veteran. He is a survivor, meaning he gets plus one survivor roll. Uh, th that's more of a campaign thing. He is determined, so he ignores shock and wound. He is quick. He's wearing heavy armor, which slows him down by one inch per turn. He's got the big sword. He's got throwing axes. 
and then he's backed up by, to his left, is a sword grunt. That guy is uh, also wearing heavy armor. He's got a shield, and he does fancy footwork. So when we get into melee, if there's a tie, he wins by one. The guy with the bow has a, a, a bow. Hey, look at that. We're going full WYSIWYG today. And uh, let's turn him a little bit more so you can see that big old bow. It's not a long bow. He didn't have enough room in his, his encumbrance for that. Here in the House of Wargaming, we love encumbrance. It drives the drama. He also has a sword to go with that. And uh, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. He's Deadeye, so he's plus one when he shoots people, which means that he's got... Uh, well, basically, he's going to roll a d10 to see if he shoots. And if he's at short range, he hits on a four. If he is at long range, he hits on a seven. Normally, that's five and eight, but he spent his traits. Now, one of the ways they balance things in this game is that your leaders have more traits and they have more equipment slots. The Baron here has given up a couple of his equipment slots to purchase an extra trait. So he's got a lot of traits to keep track of. His minions, on the other hand, all get three pieces of equipment. It's actually four, but the armor takes up two slots. Uh, the armor on this case and the bow in this case. And then they each have one trait. So we are looking at a fairly balanced fight. The question we have at hand is, as dawn rises and the priest realizes that there's doings afoot, he starts ringing the church bell and these guys come bursting out of their house and that's where the game will begin. So let's figure out which houses they come bursting out of. When the bell starts ringing, the cultists realize that the jig is up and they need to escape from town. They're running back to the Black Tower. To do that, they're going to have to get off the board in this direction, anywhere on this western side of the board. The difficulty they have is that the good guys, the townies, are going to come out of these buildings. I don't know which building. I'm going to roll three times for the chief, the sword, and the bow. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those are the houses that they come out. So for the chief, it's going to be five. For the sword, it's going to be one. And for the bow, it is going to be three. As mentioned, the cultists are just looking to get off the table to the west. They have a couple of options here. They can swing to the south. Let's talk about terrain. All the terrain blocks the line of sight with the exception of the fences down here, the hedges. Those cost one inch to get across. They're about a half an inch wide, so I'm going to charge. Basically, when you move across it, reduce the movement by one inch. The stream over here costs double movement to move across that. The stream itself is, hey, let's see how wide it is with our Wiley Games tape measure. Since the stream is an inch and a half wide, uh, it's a little over an inch. We're going to call it three inches to cross the stream, except at the ford, which you can see right here, which doesn't impede movement at all. All of the woods, double movement to get through those. Those are very thick, but you can only see into them one inch. I think that's it. This little terrain base right here, you've got some rocks and a log, and those will also block line of sight for what it's worth. So what are our cultists going to do? As a solo war gamer, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a strategy and we're going to go for it. They can go south, up the middle, or around the north. If they go up the north, it's a longer route, but there's a heck of a lot more cover that they can use. Every figure on their action gets to take two actions. They can move five inches, or they can creep three inches. If they're creeping, it means they can't be targeted by missile fire unless the guy shooting at them is within, what is it, like 12 inches? Uh, let's go to the rules as written. If the model comes within one inches of a movie, it mu of, a, of an enemy, it must stop. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Place a creep marker. It is removed uh, as it comes within 12 inches. Enemy, any enemy shooting at a creep does so at a minus one. If you have a shield, you can't creep. Hey, that's good to know. So what we're going to do next is take a look at these cards because there's some fancy pants things that you need to be aware of. I don't think we're using the Joker. And I am using the Fist Fantasy Fistful of Lead deck, which has fantastic fantasy art with the dwarfs. And, oh, you know, it doesn't say... If you've got the King of Spades, you get to go first. If you've got the Queen, you can remove all shock for the Spades, Queen of Hearts. We'll shuffle all these up, and we're going to deal out three of these to each side to figure out what order our figures go in. Everybody is on the table, and I have shuffled these up. I'm going to go ahead and give them just kind of a nice random cut or two. Oh, not the end. Kind of bumped it. There we go. 
And then we're going to deal out three cards. The cultists are slinkers. They're going to start off by heading this way, hoping to make it to the ford before these guys realize what's going on. So we're going to deal out three cards to them and three cards to the heroes. We'll figure out what the heroes do as we go. That's kind of the side we're playing. We're just going to pick a strategy for these guys. Go that way. That's all we can do for now. I think this game would work really well in a convention setting because normally what would happen is you would have your cards and you would keep them hidden from the rest of the table. The, the GM then says, hey, everybody that's got a king, play it now. Now you can see we don't have any kings. That's fine. So we're going to say, oh, we got a queen. So uh, now we're on the queens and the townies would say, yeah, I'm going to play a queen. And they you now they he also has to nominate and say, you know what, I think I'm going to go ahead and nominate my archer to move first using this queen. No special abilities. He can move twice and he can move uh, five inches for that first move. And that would put him, I think what we're going to do is move him a total of 10 inches we're going to drop him right here behind the hedge, ready to take some shots at these guys, ready to, to stop them over there. Um, you know, alternatively, we could probably move him five inches up to, I don't know, up to here, but then he's risking getting attacked. So over there is good for now, and then he's done with his turn. Then the GM says, hey, anybody got any jacks? No. Does anybody have any tens? And the cultists say, yeah, you know what? I've got a pair of 10s, and I'm going to nominate two of my characters to activate on the 10s. And I think we'll nominate the two mooks. The two mooks are both going to move and move, which means they can move a total of 9 inches. Well, if they're going to move this way, they're going to be able to move 9 inches altogether. And I think that's probably the smart play. It's 1 inch to cross over that wall. They're both wearing light armor, so that shouldn't be an issue. And we'll just kind of line them up like so. And we'll stand up the, uh, the poor dead tree one more time. And then we say, all right, does anybody have any nines? Yeah, hey, look at that. The cultists have another nine. So this cultist is also going to move his nine inches. Now, this is the leader. And I think what we can do is try to, for ten inches, uh, Boobla, there, there are some rules for... Um, we're just going to bring them up to right here. There are rules for holding your actions, but we'll look at that. That's a much more advanced situation. So we'll we'll try to use those in the next game or if a period a point comes up where we have to use in this game. For now, we have two more guys that need to move. And those two moves are going to be our leader and our swordsman. We'll use the 6 and 3. It doesn't matter at this point cuz everybody's moved. Uh, the, the, our sword boy is going to tear off across the field and try to get over to here. And that's going to be a total of two and a half inches. And then another seven and a half will get him to right about here in the fields. And then our leader can actually move. Uh, now remember, oh, you know what? I take it back. He's wearing heavy armor, which slows him down by two inches. So he's only going to be able to make it to right there. I guess we've got ourselves a nice... Uh, d d uh, safety back there. In the meantime, our leader is going to go after their leader, and that's going to be, now he can move five inches, it's three to there, and two to here. So he is going to run up to within one inch, and now we got ourselves a melee. Our first melee of the day forces us to slow down and think about what we're doing. The only situational modifier we have is that the Baron charge, so he's at plus one on a, it's going to be a roll-off. They are both veterans, so they both roll D12s. The Baron also has a sword. He's at plus one for that, so he's at a total of plus two. The Deacon is at plus one because he has a sword, and so we roll for the Baron first, and the Baron rolls a ten, and the Deacon rolls a, it's cocked, we're going to re-roll, rolls a thirteen. So the Deacon wins by three. The second step is to see if the Baron makes his armor save. Now, for the armor save, you have to roll a... Because he's wearing heavy armor, he normally would save on a six-up. But the Deacon is... What is it called? He's... Um, he is... Is it cold-blooded? No, he's, he's got a deadly melee strike. He's good at what he does. So the Baron is going to be at minus one on his armor save, and he only saves on a 7-up. With a 3, the Baron fails. 
Now, we need to take the difference in their roles. That's three. The, the worse you lose that role by, the more likely you are to be injured. And there's a, there's a simple chart. For the wound roll, you've got a simple chart. You roll a d10, and on a one through five, you, have, you are shaken. On a six through eight, you're wounded. And on a nine or better, you are out of action. We gotta add one to that because the difference in the combat roll was three. The deacon won by three, he gets a plus one on this roll. A six is going to be wounded. When you are wounded, you go to the ground, and here's where our markers come in handy. That one wound is really gonna plague the Baron for the rest of the game. Well, I mean, unless he drinks a healing potion, but since we're not doing magic yet, he's gonna be in trouble. He's also gonna be in trouble in the second round of combat, but we'll get to that if we get to that. That's the end of the turn, and now, hey, I wonder if the, let me just check, the Deacon, does he have any, uh, does he have any other, plus one for every time the opponent is, okay, nope, he does not. So we're gonna shuffle these cards up. We're just gonna do it off camera. You guys gotta learn to trust me at some point. And we are gonna go ahead and deal out one, two, three, four, five, six cards. And let's take a look at who got what. The good guys get a 10, 5, and an ace. Now, the ace is a wild card. That opens up some possibilities. On the other side of the table, we get a, a, a 6, a 9, and a 4. So the game master says, hey, does anybody have any kings that want to go? And the baron says, yes, I would like to go on the kings. He really wants to stand up. Oops. One thing I forgot. When you win a close combat, you have the option of doing nothing. You stay locked in combat. Or you can push your opponent back two inches. Or you can trade places with them. In this case, the deacon is going to trade places. This is how things start out. When you are locked in combat at the start of your turn, you have no choice but to fight. Bear in mind the deacon, uh, the baron rather, is prone, which in melee should give him a minus one unless I'm missing something. Shooting in close combat, uh, if they are, you get minus one for the wound and minus one for prone. So maybe we don't want to go first with him. Maybe we want to see what that, uh, what that deacon is going to do. We'll force him to use his action in combat and instead we'll wait. We'll say, why don't we go ahead and, uh, yeah, we're going to call that ace a, oh, you know, you know what we could do. You know what we can do? We can declare this ace a queen of hearts. That means the baron will get to go first, and the queen of hearts allows you to remove one wound and recover and jump to your feet. So thanks to the miracle of that ace, the baron leaps back to his feet and is no longer wounded. Oh, you got a lot of opportunities for that queen to come up. Love it. Now this is the only thing he's going to be able to do, and he is going to, I don't think that, I don't think that costs a move. Let's go to the rule book. If a figure begins its turn within one inch of an enemy figure, it must use its first action to fight. Now we got a case where both of our boys are going to be rolling a d12, adding one to the result. And our, oh, I should specify, the Baron is going to roll first. He's going to get a 10. And the Deacon is going to get a 7. So the rolls are reversed. It's going to be a plus one to the wound roll for the deacon. However, the deacon is in a little bit of trouble because he has light armor, giving him an eight plus save. But because the baron has a big old sword, so he's got the double-handed Zvehander, his armor gets reduced by one step. It's as though he's wearing no armor whatsoever. He does not get an armor save. He's just going to roll on the wound chart Difference of three, that's going to be a plus one. How the rolls have reversed, but with a two, all that guy is going to get is a shock marker. Not good for him. Shock markers are going to reduce your ability to move and your ability to fight and your ability to shoot at a minus one. That was only our Baron's first turn. Ah, and he has the option now of trading places or pushing the guy back or staying locked in combat. I think we're going to go ahead and trade places. The reason for that is the Baron wants to try to force the Deacon back around. Remember, he's got backup coming right over here. He's just off screen. You can't see him. 
but that that prevents the deacon from sprinting down the road and escaping on this turn. With the second action of the turn, the baron, I guess, can he fight again? You can only initiate one close combat per turn. That means that our bloody baron, Baron Nerob, is going to uh, forego his second option. Now, he could have pushed the deacon back and used his second action to move or recover if he had shock or whatnot. He's not. Next up in the order is going to be, does anybody have any jacks, any tens? Yeah, we got a ten over here. And that means it's time for our... Do we want to fire with our archer? Yeah, let's do that. Going to take a shot at the nearest enemy. That's going to be the big axe man. This is a range of a um, scant six inches. That makes it a close range shot. Normally, he has a toughness number of five. However, and I'm going to roll a d20. We're going to ignore the tens place. Because he has dead eye, he's at plus one. Because there's... Uh, soft cover, he's going to be a minus one. Because he's using his first action to aim, he is going to be at a total of plus one, meaning his target number is going to be four up. And with a three, he has failed. And that's the end of his turn. Not only that, it takes one action to reload. So we're going to put a little bullet marker down to remind ourselves that he has loaded. And with that, we move on to card number nine. Does anyone have a nine they'd like to play? Oh, yeah, you know it. The Axeman is going to roll on through with a nine. Now, he is five inches or six inches away, we said. So we got to do an edit here because I did something wrong. The Axeman is going to move. He's going to use both of his actions to run into close combat. Now, the Axeman is a brute, and that means he rolls a d12 on close combat. But, because he's a bit of a berserker, if he loses this combat, he's going to have a plus one to his wound roll. He's got a massive axe, which gives him a plus one, and uh, armor-piercing one. The bow grunt does have a sword. He's got time to pull that sword out. So what we're looking at all together is going to be a plus one for this guy on the d12. That's going to be a result of two for the Axeman. Oh, I'm sorry. It's going to be two for... Yeah, that's right. The D12 is the Axeman. He rolled a two. The Bowman rolled a four, winning the combat by... Well, wait a second. You know what? He's got his totem. He says, uh-uh, I'm using my reroll. It's his only reroll for the game. But instead of getting a two, he gets an eight, and that's going to be a huge difference. With the plus one, that's going to... Well, that's because, remember, they're, they're both wielding plus one weapons, so those kind of negate... But he does get the plus one for the charge. That becomes a nine. He wins by five. And when you win the melee roll off by five, you are going to add plus two to the wound roll. Not only that, but the big double-handed axe is armor piercing. So the light armor of that bowman is reduced to no armor whatsoever. He doesn't get an armor save. We're just going to roll a d10 on the wound chart. And with a four, we add two. To the, to the wounding, because again, he's... A, do we? Do we really? The axe grunt does not. It's, it's just armor piercing. That's it. Okay, so he rolls a four, and... Oh, but because he won by five, we have to add two, so that be, makes it a six, and our bowman is now wounded. And not only is he wounded, he's forced back another inch out of the way. And we did that. So that when we get count down, nine, eight, seven, six, ah, look at that. Our sword guy is able to move 10 inches. And he's going to do that. He's going to move a total of six inches to the forward, and then he's going to cross for free. That's an inch and a half, and he's going to get another three and a half inches, and that's going to take him all the way to here as he sprints for safety. And then... We count down from six to five, and the only guy that has not gone on the side of the townies is our sword guy. And sword guy has to choose now. Does he want to cut off this swordman, or does he want to run to the rescue of the bowman? And I think you got to run to the rescue of your bro, because he's going to get hit pretty bad. Using both actions to move, he's only going to be able to move nine inches, and the field here... 
All right, so it's going to be, he's going to lose one inch. How do we do this? He's got a choice. He can run through the field, which does reduce movement by half, or he can run around this way. And I think we got to run around this way. It's going to cost him one inch to hop over that wall, and it's going to cost him five, six inches to get to here. He's only got four inches of movement left. That's only going to be able to take him to right about there for our swordman, which is not close enough to help anybody out, but at least he is, at least he's almost there. That's the end of the turn. It's time to shuffle those cards. And we'll zoom out to give you a better appreciation for the overall geometry of the battlefield. I don't like zooming in and out. I like these kind of softer edits. Uh, you can hear me shuffling the cards as I vamp until we get back to the next chorus. Um, by kind of zooming in and out, we get a better appreciation, not just for the overall geometry of the battlefield, but also for the character of the characters. And you can see our sword guys running away over there. We've got a couple, we've got our, our towny swordy is here to help out his, his bow brother. Um, so we're going to dial a deal one, two, three cards for the cultists and one, two, three for the townies. And we start with the kings. I didn't see what was that last one. Looks like the townies are getting a, a little better jump off the starting block here with an ace, king, and four, and then nine, five, six. Again, this game as a two-player game, there's probably solo rules. In fact, I know there are. If you go to Wiley Games, there's a PDF that tells you how to do the solo rules. But I want to learn the game itself before we get into that. So the question becomes, what are we going to do with this? We say, hey, we got kings. Anybody going to go? And the townies say, yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to go. We're going to go ahead and we're going to fight here. You know, I feel like we missed this guy's turn on that last turn. Oh, if I did, put a comment, right, that, oh, you didn't fight with that guy. And make sure you make it really insulting so it's gone within 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, we watch those things pretty closely. Um, be that as it may, we're going to start with the Baron once again with the King. We'll save this Queen for the Insta Recovery. And it's a little bit cheap, I know, because, you know, I already see, oh, they don't get to go, so he's going to get to go. And normally you'd be like, oh, because bear in mind, if I use this ace as a queen of hearts and they've got a queen of hearts, this real queen of hearts goes first. Something to be aware of. But we don't need to be aware of it today because our, our baron is going to go first and he is going to whack at his enemy. And in this case, there's no charging, but because the deacon has a shock, he is at minus one on this roll. Otherwise, yeah, so we're just going to call it like that. Uh, we'll roll for him first. He rolls a one, and he says, nope, I'm re-rolling. Well, it's a roll-off. Let's see what happens here. So, yeah, the, the Baron gets an eight, and the Deacon says, yeah, I'm using my one re-roll, and I'm going to wind up with a six. Now, that's probably a good idea, even though he's still lost by two. The difference is... Losing by two, if he had lost by the, the six points, he would be at minus one on the roll. No, at plus two on the wound roll. Here, there's no bonuses. The deacon does have light armor, but again, with a big two-handed sword, he does not get his armor save. We just go straight to the wound check, and that wound check is going to be a three. Straight three means he's going to get another shock. I think one, two, three is that shock. He is shaken, so we put another one of these down, and he's going to be at minus two. You can't recover when you're within one inch of your of your foe, so our Baron is going to say, yeah, you know what, given that you're hurting, I'm going to stay locked in. Then we say, that was the kings, do we have any queens that want to go? And the bowman says, yeah, I'm a queen, I'm a queen of hearts. He's one inch away, remember, this guy put him one inch away, so he's going to use the free queen to heal that wound. He does need to reload. And now the question is, does he want to run away or does he want to shoot? And he could shoot at that guy. Because <sighs> he doesn't, you know, he, and he doesn't know what's going to happen with this guy either, uh, with the axe man. Mm, I kind of, see, this is where the bluffing game comes in when you're fighting your opponents. I think because the next card is low enough that a reasonable player would say, yeah, you know what, uh, I, I don't want to get stuck in another melee with this guy, but I'm willing because I got backup. I'll just go ahead and take the, the high percentage play here is to roll with the dead eye, 
We are now. He doesn't get the aiming bonus, but the Axe Man is not behind cover, so it's going to be a straight roll of. Uh, he does have Dead Eye, so it's going to be a straight four plus to hit, and with an eight, he does hit. There is a separate chart for when you're shooting with a bow, um, and you hit really well. I want to say uh, close combat. I guess not. Nah, I'm not seeing it. So we just roll on. Oh, do we roll on the wound chart? Or is the sword grunt? No, he's wearing light armor, so he's got the eight up armor save. And with a four, he does not get it, so we roll on the wound chart. And with a one, it's going to be just a shock for that guy. He says, blink! The boss, they shooting at me! That's not good. So then we got to keep counting down, down to nine. And the question is, who do we want to go first with the nine? He seems to have gotten away, so let's use this guy. He's got a couple of choices here. He can, the Axe Man can use both of his actions to remove that one shock. Alternatively, he could use one action to make a recovery roll. That recovery roll is going to be at minus one because of the shock die. And normally, on a six through ten, you'd be unshaken and you'd still get one, uh, you remove all the shock and you get one action. On a two through five, you're still shaken, but you can move five inches. And on a one or less, he just is removed from play. We're going to do that. So on a one or a two, he's removed. And on a one, he is just out of the game. So we went for the high risk, high reward, and it didn't pay off, which may come to haunt us later. We now have more cards. No, we don't. That was his one action, so he's gone. And, oh, our bowman fired, so he does need a reload marker. Then we continue counting down. We've got to move on a six. Who's going to go on a six? And a six is a free reload. Mmm, Townies could have used that one, huh? On a six, let's go ahead and move that sword guy. He definitely wants to escape to live another day. Now, funnily enough, he's... Well, let's measure it first. Two inches to get to the woods, and then he's going to move. He's got eight inches left over, so he's going to be able to run to the far side of the woods. And I think he is as good as gone Kind of put him right here so you can see him. But he is well beyond the one inch, so he's, on the next turn, he's just going to flee. Uh, funnily enough, one of his special abilities is that he's very loyal. On that recovery roll, you ignore any result of, um, the, the, like we saw the Axe Man do. <laughs> As a, he's not running away because of a failed recovery. He's running away because his player is just a big fat chicken. Then we go down to number five, and that means we got to do this fella right here. Now, when you are begin to turn in close combat, you have to do close combat to start. That's got to be your first action. It, and then we'll see what happens. Again, it's going to be a d12 for the Baron at a total of plus one. The Baron gets a four, and the, uh, the Deacon gets a total of 12. Does the Baron have any rerolls? Uh, ignore shot move? No, he does not. So that's going to be a difference of eight. The Baron does have an armor save. He's wearing heavy armor. The one is going to be a failure. And then for the wound, he's going to get a 10. When you add the extra three, he is now out of action. Holy cats. This game is more deadly than I thought. Now, we will go through. I wasn't planning on doing a campaign, but since we're stepping up, I think what we'll do is we'll just add one guy. So we're doing a four-on-four four for the next fight, and then we'll do a full five-on-five. Uh, let's see. Oh, man, is there anything we can do with this? He's determined, ignore... No, he's got nothing. That's it. That's the end. Now, that was his... That was the Deacon's first move. His second move, he is going to make a recovery roll. And I... You know, he, he rolls the d12 for his recovery. And on a two, minus two... Oh, this is hysterical. Remember that you re reduce that by two, and, uh, yeah, he's, uh, shaking, so he routes. So he, uh, he just runs off the battlefield. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. so he is removed from play, and now it's down to, well, I guess that's really the end of the game, right? Because, uh, our swordman gets a four, and so he's gonna kind of, you know, move his ten inches to chase after the guy. And then on the next turn, uh, he's, he doesn't have enough movement to catch. So what you'll see on the next turn is that 
this guy is closer to the the board side, so he's going to escape. In the end, we had let's let's you know what I got a graveyard here. Let's let's put our fallen guys in the graveyard and see what happens. So that was kind of a fun little game, huh? Wasn't it? See, this is one of the reasons I don't like to do reviews of rule sets until after I have played them. Jay Wiley has spent years developing this game, and I think I'm going to spend 30 minutes reading through the rule book and go, oh yeah, he made some mistakes. I just kind of figured it out. I don't think so. You got to trust your experts, at least the ones that aren't bought and paid for by the pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> Wasn't planning on doing a full campaign, but they do have a post-game recovery role. If you want to see what happens after the game, or decide to play a campaign, there's a chance you may lose some figures along the way. What happened to the Deacon? He took it on the chin, and we roll a d10, and on this roll, uh, really you want to do... Um, this is a survival roll, and you want to roll high. No, you want to roll low. Um, the deacon here routed, but he was on the losing side. So he's got a plus one to this roll. Let's just roll. He's got a plus one. And with a five, it's merely a flesh wound. But, so he ran away. All that, Sturm and Drang, and he ran away. The axe man, on the other hand, with a result of a five, also merely a flesh wound. But we're going to call that, um, he was captured by the townies. And then we need to roll for the baron. And for the Baron, we roll a five. He was out of action. That becomes a six, which is, it's not so bad. Retinue member must miss the next game. However, one of the traits that the Baron has, you don't get to be an old Baron if you are a sickly Baron. So I gave him the trait survivor, meaning he gets a minus one on that roll. So between being out of action and being a survivor, it's going to take more than a couple of little stabby wounds to put him down. So he survives as well. If you roll a 10, the guy is completely out. If you roll a 9, uh, the he's gravely wounded, so he's got to miss the next game, uh, and is permanently damaged. He has to take a negative trait. So that's kind of neat. Negative traits are things like, you know, he's got a limp, or, uh, you know, he's minus one at melee. It's all the usual, right? He... He's gonna, he's, uh, what, do we, what else we got here? Squeamish. He's got a minus one to all his wound rolls, kind of a nagging injury. But that is the end of our first kind of, kind of exploratory game of Fistful of Lead, Might, and Melee. In our next game, I, this is, should go live on Wednesday. I think we'll maybe wind up making Wednesday our Fistful of Lead day. We'll add in another retinue member for each side, and since the Baron was the winner, and he does have a prisoner. He is going to set off in pursuit. He's had enough of the Dark Sorcerer's nonsense, and he's going to set off. He's going to gather up the rest of a posse, and I guess we'll set him off. Uh, he's in hot pursuit of the Deacon, the sword guy that survived, and whoever else is in his retinue that were kind of waiting to rendezvous with them. The important thing is that the Black Sorcerer was not able to desecrate the hallowed ground here in the cemetery next to the churchyard. So good job for the good guys. They came in the winning side this time. Not always the case, although ultimately, you know, y y spoiler alert, the good guys are going to win. Be good to each other. Till next time, I'm praying for you.